All right, we just got back out of the woods and we found this beautiful specimen of Herichium coralloides. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tissue clone this on agar. That's gonna be the first step. What I want to do in this video is I wanna show you the entire process from wild mushroom, which we have here, all the way to cultivated mushroom. So the entire process from tissue cloning, grain spawn, spawning to substrate, all that, all the way through. So let's head down in the lab and see what we can do. So I have four sterile agar plates here. This is light malt extract agar. And those are what our little pieces of hopefully sterile tissue of Herichium coralloides are gonna go onto those. I have some little strips of parafilm cut up all ready to go underneath. Those are what we're gonna use to seal our Petri plates once we get our little pieces of tissue on there. That's gonna keep all the contams out hopefully. And I have a scalpel here and a sterile scalpel blade. And I have a propane torch. And I have a pair of scissors that I'm probably not gonna use. But anyway, we're going to put a sterile scalpel blade onto our scalpel and that's what we're going to use to grab our little pieces of tissue out of our mushroom after we tear it open. So that scalpel blade is sterile right out of the package, so for the first transfer I won't have to do anything with the flame. But for subsequent transfers we will be sterilizing our scalpel blade with our propane torch. You do want to keep the fruit body downwind of your other equipment on the flow hood table. This fruit body is far from sterile. There's bacteria, I'm sure other weed fungi spores on the surface of this wild fruit body because it's been out in the woods. It's been exposed to open air. So keep it downwind of your plates and your other equipment. And when you transfer, transfer upwind into the more sterile air right in front of the surface of your HEPA filter onto your Petri plates. And then we'll flip them over. We're gonna do four plates, four different little pieces of tissue out of this fruit body on four plates and hopefully we'll get some nice sterile mycelium running across the plate and we can go from there. You want to be slow and deliberate with your motions when you're doing this. It's going to help reduce your risk of contamination. Just looking to tear that mushroom open and expose some sterile internal tissue. You don't need a big piece of tissue. Just the tiny little bit you see on my scalpel blade there is fine. And you're just going to drop it carefully in the middle of your agar plate and move on to the next. The goal here is never 100% success when you're doing these initial tissue transfers. Odds are if you're working with a wild mushroom, you are going to get some contamination. That's why we do multiple plates. Hopefully we get a couple good ones that we can sector off and move to the next generation. Always keep in mind the order of sterility too. Always keep your more sterile items upstream near the flow hood like our agar plates. Less sterile items downstream like our mushrooms. And just using some parafilm here to help seal our plates. It's like a stretchy film. Help seal them up and don't forget to label. Alright guys, welcome back. We've let our initial four plates grow for a little over a week. Three of the four plates that are still in the tub here are looking really nice. Looks like we got a clean piece of tissue. So three out of four are looking really nice. And we have one here that is not looking very nice that I'm gonna show you. Normally I would just toss this right out, but I saved it. Nice example for the video. So we have this plate here. Obviously heavy mold contamination. This is common when doing tissue culture with fruit bodies. So not a bad ratio at all to just have one bad out of four but obviously once you see these dark colors whether it be black or green this is actually like a dark green developing here this is obviously a mold contaminant and your mycelium is not gonna have a prayer so just go ahead and chuck this out this is what you really want them to look like the herichium mycelium can be very wispy it's usually very fast growing so what i'm going to try and do is i'm going to try and grab a agar wedge a sector of mycelium from kind of the outer edge of the growth here you wouldn't want to be right next to that original piece of tissue because that can still be carrying contams i buy these plates pre-poured from midwest grow kits they do contain a small amount of antibiotic called chloramphenicol that chloramphenicol will help prevent bacterial germination is really handy when you're doing tissue culture like this but there could still be some latent bacterial contamination there so i don't want to get right next to that piece of tissue i want to get 
out on the edge of that mycelial growth where it's most likely to be nice and clean. And then we'll go ahead and sector that to our next generation of plates. Those Gen 1 plates with the mushroom tissue are definitely going to be the most likely to harbor latent contamination. So that's why we sector clean mycelium from them onto additional generations of plates. You're looking to sector clean mycelium away from any potential contamination. So here I'm just taking those initial clean Gen 1 plates, cutting a small auger wedge, and just like we did with the mushroom tissue, just dropping that wedge onto a new clean auger plate, and that becomes our second generation. Typically I'll do three generations. That's what I did with this project. Get clean mycelium on your Gen 3 plates, and go ahead and take that to grain. All right, welcome back mushroom party people. What is up? Doing a little flow hood work tonight. I regret to inform you we are not to the fun and exciting part yet. Still have some more lab work ahead of us. And I'm kind of tired. I worked all day. It's in the evening here now. But we're going to try and make it fun. I got a cocktail going to jam out to some music and we're going to do some auger transfers so you can see again this herichium mycelium is a little weird a lot different than some of the other mycelium like shiitake maitake oysters kind of wispy gets these little chunky dense chunky parts but these are let's see the bottom there Beautifully colonized, tons of mycelium here. So we're ready to drop onto some grain. I'm gonna do three jars in the hopes that at least two of them colonize cleanly. And then we can do a couple test blocks with this strain for them out on some pasteurized fuel pellets and see what they look like. That's the fun part. This is not the fun part, at least for me. I'm not, I'm a lab nerd, but I'm not enough of a lab nerd to think that this is the fun part. So maybe you are. If you are, good for you. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to set these grain jars up, drop a few auger wedges into each one off these plates. Then we'll shake them up, move them into a tub for incubation. So I have some wheat grain with some wheat bran mixed in. I didn't want to wait for the grain to dry out, so I just mixed in some dry wheat bran. Works really good. You don't have to wait for your grain to air dry. Plus you get some wheat bran mixed in with your grain. And the mycelium really likes that too. It's a way to sneak some extra supplementation into your blocks, especially if you're doing my pasteurized fuel pollen method. So we have wheat grain mixed with wheat bran. We're gonna drop some auger wedges in there. I'm not gonna talk a lot about sterile technique. Everything has been sprayed down with 70% isopropyl. I'm gonna be gloved up, masked up. So I'm gonna keep this clip kind of short because this is gonna be a long video, so. Let's jam this out. I like to pre-loosen my lids. That allows me to just easily lift that lid with my left hand as I drop the wedges in with my right hand. Seems to work well for me. What I'm doing with the plate here is I'm just gonna cut a strip and then I'm gonna cut that strip into three separate pieces. And then I'm gonna try and pick all three pieces up with my scalpel blade and carefully drop those into my grain jar. Now these pieces of agar are very sticky and they have a tendency to stick on the inside of your grain jars so you need to be careful when you shake them you want to get them down into your grain and not like stuck to your lid or up to the side of your grain jar it's a little bit of an art to it but after you do it a few times you'll get the hang of it get that agar down in there so it'll go ahead and start colonizing your grain and as always don't forget to label all right guys, now we're getting to the fun part. Our three jars of spawn look really good actually. So we're gonna go ahead and prep our substrate. It's gonna go straight pasteurized oak pellets. These are Bear Mountain oak pellets used for barbecue grills, pellet grills. And I originally found this mushroom growing on oak. So I think oak is the obvious choice. So I'm just gonna be using my simple pasteurized fuel pellet process. Not adding any bran here. I did add bran to my grain spawn, so we will be sneaking some bran into our blocks that way. So this is it. This is how our bags are looking. Just 3T filter patch bags right from Unicorn Bags. Have our two pounds of dry oak pellets in there. So on the stove here, I have a pot of boiling water. What we're going to do is we're going to weigh out two pounds, 13 ounces of boiling water. 
We're gonna add that right to our filter patch bags. That's gonna perfectly hydrate it. And also the heat is gonna help pasteurize our fuel pellets, give us a longer colonization window. So what we're gonna do is add the water. So we're going two pounds dry fuel pellets, two pounds, 13 ounces boiling water. We'll move it over to the impulse sealer, seal the bag. And then I'm just gonna put these bags in a cooler. We'll leave them hot in the cooler for anywhere from 60 to 90 minutes is fine. Then at that point, once they've sat for 60 to 90 minutes hot, you can just sit them out on a table, let them cool, and we'll move on to the next step. You definitely don't wanna inoculate your substrate with grain spawn until it's cooled to room temperature or else you're just gonna kill your mycelium. So I'm gonna run through this process very quick. I show this in a lot of my other videos, but I just have a simple digital kitchen scale here, a container to weigh my two pounds, 13 ounces of water. Make yourself a little funnel, super handy out of a milk or water jug. It's gonna help hold your bag open as I pour that boiling water into the bag. You get to see the process here and then we'll move on to the next step. Moisture balance is pretty critical in this process, so you do want to get it as accurate as you can. Helps to have one of these little measuring cups. This amount of water works perfect for the pellets that I'm using, but keep in mind you may have to adjust up or down a little bit based on what brand pellets you're using, but this should get you in the ballpark. down on that impulse sealer arm let it seal make sure you hold the arm down I usually do it for about 10 seconds that'll let that plastic cool down so that way you don't rip your bag when you lift this arm back up the heat cycle runs on a timer on its own so the heat cycle stopped a little while ago even though I'm holding the arm down this is just going to keep it from ripping the plastic when the arm pops up As soon as the water hits those fuel pellets, they start expanding right away. You can see that there, but really simple substrate prep. Put them into the cooler 60 to 90 minutes and that's it. All right guys, we are set up here in front of the flow hood with everything we need to go ahead and inoculate our bags. We just have two bags here, we're holding one bag just because of space. Our bags are pasteurized, sealed, in front of the flow hood. We have our three grain jars, which I'm gonna show you a little more close up here in a second. And we have our impulse sealer set up again over here. So what we're gonna do, really simple, we're gonna take our scissors, we're gonna cut the tops off our bag just below our seal. We're gonna shake up these grain jars a little bit just to break those kernels of grain up. We're gonna dump one quart jar into each bag. So once we have the grain in all three of our bags, I'm gonna turn the flow hood off, I'm gonna give them a little squeeze just to check for leaks. Best way to check for leaks in your bags is to listen. If you have a little pinhole, you don't hear that air seeping out. If we don't have any leaks, we're gonna give them a good shake. You wanna evenly distribute all that spawn. This is your typical fully colonized herichium spawn. So I get a lot of questions on this. A lot of new growers wanna start with lion's mane or another species of herichium and they buy a liquid culture syringe, they do some grain, and they're like, what the heck is going on? I can't see any mycelium. This herichium mycelium is super wispy, super hard to see. Just lightly covers the grain. When you start to see these little dense white spots that you see here, their grain is probably fully colonized. But all three of these jars look really good. Didn't get any contamination. What you would want to look for is some wet looking greasy spots, something like that that would indicate bacterial contams or possibly some off color, weird looking growth that would indicate mold contams, but these look really good. Cool thing about this pasteurized fuel pilot process is it's just a very forgiving substrate so you don't have to be super psychotic about your sterile tech when you're doing these bag inoculations. You can see I listed the help of my lovely young assistant here. We're just putting a quart jar of grain bran mixture into each bag, hitting it with the impulse sealer and good to go. So as long as you keep everything clean you should have really high success rates even without a flow hood with this process. We are spawning heavy. But when using unsupplemented substrate, that just helps boost your yields and speed up colonization. Alright guys, the best way to tell if you have any leaks in your bags is just to give them a little squeeze like this and listen. If there's a little pinhole, you will hear it. After that, once you're sure you don't have any leaks, just gotta shake it up really well and be ready to go on the shelves.
So mixing that bran in with your grain spawn is a great little trick. It helps you dry out your grain more quickly so you don't have to let it air dry. Also, you can sneak some bran into your block without having to worry about increasing your contamination risk. And it also gives you extra inoculation points. So instead of just having those grain kernels, you have all those little bits of bran in there too. So it's just gonna help your block colonize faster, get some extra nutrients in there. So all good all around. All right guys, we are officially to the fun part. We have our first block in the fruiting chamber and you can see we have some nice fruits going here. I'm running the fruiting chamber about 87% humidity, more in the low 60s to around 60 degrees Fahrenheit in here. And this block was a little bit ahead of the other two, so I moved it into fruiting a little earlier. The other ones I held back to let them go a little longer in colonization just to see if there'd be a difference in how they fruited or not. But this one is progressing more slowly than what I'm used to with the other herichium strain that I grow. But I've never grown Herichium Coralloides before. I've only grown Herichium Americanum. So if you guys grow a lot of Coralloides, hit me up in comments. Let me know if this species is a little slower for you than maybe Arenaceous or Americanum. Well, I think the first block is ready to pick off because they're starting to drop some spores. Not super spined out, but I'm going to go ahead and pick this one off. Still got two more to go. Looking forward to trying these guys out, even though the yield isn't amazing. Still some pretty little mushrooms. All right, so here's the first flush on our other two blocks, guys. And I think I'm gonna go ahead and end the video here. Obviously, we have not captured a super high yielding strain here. It is making some beautiful mushrooms. These coralloides are just really cool. I'll zoom you in here in a minute so you can see up close the structure of these mushrooms, but not high yielding by any means. My Americanum yields much, I'd say double what this one does on first flush, but that's just part of the game when you're cloning wild mushrooms. Unless you notice a specific trait in the wild mushroom you pick that you're trying to bring into culture, if you're just hunting a species, you really don't know what you're going to get until you actually try and grow it out. They do taste amazing, like most Arichium do. I cooked up the, the last batch from the first block I picked. They were excellent. Also, another interesting trait I've noticed with these is some Arichium are really demanding a fresh air exchange. This one doesn't seem to be. And I don't know if it's a trait of this specific strain or maybe of the species. As I mentioned, this is my first time growing Coralloides. But I think you could grow these right in a monotub and still get normal shaped fruits. I wasn't giving these a ton of fresh air exchange and I still got some really nicely shaped fruits. So that was kind of interesting. When you do capture a strain from the wild, it's good to run multiple tests on it. Just because it's not a super high yielding strain doesn't mean it won't have other interesting traits that might make it good for culture. But at least I was able to show you guys the entire journey from picking to production. This has been a six month journey, actually started in September. We're in early March now. So I'm gonna end it here, guys. A nice close up of one of our nicest fruit bodies on our first flush. You can see all those little spines. Typical of Herichium, typical of the species Coralloides. Beautiful little mushroom. So hit me up in comments, guys. Let me know what you think. If you get something out of this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. That really does help shoot it out into the expansive YouTube meta and make it worth me taking all the time to make these videos so i always appreciate that and definitely hit me up in comments let me know what you think and i will catch you next video